This program has been made possible by a grant from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. The UCF Office of Research and Commercialization is committed to moving the discoveries of our faculty and students from ideas to innovation to realization. By moving research from the laboratory to the private sector, we are helping to diversify Florida's economy and helping to bring high paying jobs to our state. This program presents some examples of our research and our efforts to transition this research to the private sector. Hello once again and welcome to Zenith. I'm your host, Ed Hyland. Today our look at the world of research takes you to a convention dedicated to promoting and supporting technology transfer through education, advocacy, networking, and communication. We'll also hear about life sciences technologies and how tech transfer is building at the University of Central Florida. It's all coming up next on Zenith. The mission of the Office of Technology Transfer at the University of Central Florida is to proactively facilitate the transfer of technology from the university to the commercial sector through enlightened technology transfer policies, processes that efficiently and effectively reduce off-the-shelf technology inventory, and dedication to customers and being easy to do business with. Our guiding principles are development of intellectual property assets, licensing them into the commercial sector, which leads to a return on investment for the university. We envision an eventual contribution to the economic development within the Central Florida region, the state, and the nation. UCF will be recognized as a contributor and leader in the future economic performance of the Central Florida region. The Association of University Technology Managers bills itself as a living, dynamic network of technology transfer professionals. At its recent annual meeting in Central Florida, we spoke with Autumn's new president about the organization and how tech transfer is linking academic, research, government, legal, and commercial interests. Autumn is the Association of University Technology Managers, and it's a community of individuals that represent different professions, uh, like the legal profession, and it's also individuals from industry, but primarily it is individuals from academic institutions who are dedicated to um, the movement of uh, technologies and information and knowledge through a mechanism that we call technology transfer from universities into industry. Uh, it's really important to facilitate and have this exchange because uh, the federal government spends about $48 billion a year uh, in uh, research funding at academic institutions. And all of that research isn't necessarily focused on commercialization. It is dedicated to the advancement of science. Uh, in that advancement of science, there's always interesting things that have commercial applications. And it's important to identify what those interesting things are and have a mechanism that translates that interesting tidbit of information into a commercial application that can be used by the public and it's for the benefit of the public. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, the, uh, the United States uh, is the leader in the field. Uh, it was uh, because of uh, some seminal legislation, uh, the Bayh-Dole Act, which was passed in 1980, that has led to the development of this industry. Uh, other countries like Taiwan, like Japan, um, the UK are following in those footsteps and uh, it's, it's a very exciting time for us. Um, companies are downsizing, investment uh, portfolios are downsizing, so we need to be more, even more creative in how technology moves from universities into industry. Um, one of the things, um, uh, that I remember in the last cycle of 
uh, reduction in force, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, was that the industry relied more heavily on universities as a source of technologies. So I'm sure that somewhere between those two things, we're going to find a balance uh, of activity and engage and continue to engage with industry to, to move things out. Academia and the biotech industry and the pharma industry have always had a fairly good relationship because of the nature of the bioscience research that happens in academic institutions. Um, so that's always a very strong interaction um, and I think it'll continue to be strong. Uh, we're seeing some increased level of uh, interactions, for example, in um, software, in IT. Uh, you know, my domain expertise is in the healthcare field, so I can't speak too much to the other side, but, but we're seeing a lot of activity across the board that is, you know, fairly, uh, fairly comparable. While not leading Autumn, Dr. Padan is the Director of Technology and Research Collaborations at Oregon Health and Science University. Up next, we caught up with the Director of Life Sciences Technologies at the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. She's also taken a lead role in the Office of Tech Transfer at UCF. Much more after we double check our fast facts. We're here at the Autumn Conference, the Association of University Technology Managers. I'm joined by Svetlana Strom, who is uh, the Associate Director for Life Sciences and Technology Transfer at the University of Central Florida. Thanks so much for coming by and joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> can, can you give us kind of the big, the big picture, the big umbrella picture, if you will, of, of kind of the state of technology transfer right now as you see it? Sure. Technology transfer is, this is a really exciting time for us. Um, technology transfer is really the bridge between research and, com and commercialization. So we, um, we, we take the inventions, we work with companies, and we market technologies, and we try to get the technologies out there, get the companies interested, get them to commercialize and make products that then can, be, can enter into the, the market. And it's an exciting time for us because um, we, we're expecting that the government stimulus package is going to come in, and that's going to put extra funding into government agencies that are sponsoring the research at universities. So we're hoping that the government agencies can, can then, of course, set forward that money to the universities, and, and, and our research budgets will, will expand um, and, and really help us in, in commercializing, developing our innovation. Um, a lot of the faculty have been asked to uh, prepare um, uh, research grant applications they're already standing by so that they can take advantage of the stimulus package and the money that's coming in and, and bring extra research dollars into the university. Is this a tough time right now for, um, I, I guess the process is the term I'll use, but um, the dollars have been short up to now. And of course the stimulus package is holding a lot of hope for us, right. but at the same time, is it, is it a tough time? Has, has UCF been able to kind of grasp the bull by the horns and, and make do with what, what we have right now? Yeah, we we've definitely are trying to make do with what we have. Um, our, bu our budget is, is shrinking. Um, the, the most, uh, probably where we feel it the most is the amount of money that we have to um, file patent applications and work with the attorneys. So our attorney budget is, is shrinking. We're trying to really make the most of it. We are um, triaging some of the technologies, asking the inventors to um, 
to, to, to maybe go back and generate a little more data before we go ahead and file. Um, so, and inventors have been really cooperative. Some are saying, well, we can delay maybe announcing this invention or delay actually revealing critical information about it and present maybe in more general terms um, to give us more time to generate more data so that when we do file, we'll, we'll have um, much more information, we'll have a stronger patent application. So we really work closely with our scientists to make sure we can get the most information into the patent applications because we can't afford to file multiple versions of it and because the, the budget is just so much tighter now. And that's something a lot, I don't think a lot of people realize that, that you know, a great idea is, is wonderful, but it takes a lot of money to take that great idea and turning it into something tangible and then actually get it to market, get it out there where that technology can be transferred. Somewhere. Right, absolutely. I mean, it, it starts out with just uh, trying to record all that information, talk to the scientists, explore what else needs to be done. What will they need to get it a little bit further? Do they need, um, because I'm in life sciences, so I'll kind of use life science examples. Do we need more animal data? Maybe what they, the, the, the idea came out of an early stage experiment just with cell, cell lines. Well, that, that's okay, we can capture their idea, but boy, we could get a lot more if we can prove it further and show that this works in, in animals. So what would that take? Do they need a grant? Do they need some money? We put them in touch with, with our proposal people who can help them identify opportunities where they can bring more money into it so they can develop the invention further. Come back, now we're gonna have a stronger um, piece of technology, stronger uh, patent applications. So we kind of work closely with our inventors to try to get it as mature as possible, try to, to capture as much. If they come to us and they say, I've got these compounds, they, they seem to be really active in the cell line. We go, well, you know, do we do we need animal data to kind of substantiate that? Do do we need to try to maybe think about analogs or derivatives of these compounds that may and maybe better? Do we want to try to grab that? So we try to really proactively work with them, try to explore, try to grab as broad of a piece of intellectual property as we can because that's going to be more um, enticing to companies when they try to commercialize it. If we just take a little narrow slice, they go, well, that's a great idea, but what about, you know, what about other derivatives? What about animals? What about related compounds? You didn't capture that. So, so it, the goal is really to get as broad of intellectual property protection, but work with the scientists to make it realistic. I mean, if we can't ask them to do derivatives if they don't have a collaboration with a chemist where they can actually um, derive these compounds and test them. So we, we assess what their capabilities are, talk to them, and, and plan ahead for what we're going to be able to carve out and how we're going to explore that and market it. Do, do you act as a facilitator also in the sense that um, there are people in the pipeline, I'll call it, and, and okay, it's a pretty good idea, but this one may not go all the way. Here's somebody else that also has a pretty good idea. Gee, these two ideas just may work together. We, we try to do that. Um, the scientists feel very strongly about having academic freedom, and, and so even though I say, well, we explore the possibility of derivatives or whatever, we really explore it in the context that we know they have the capability, or we ask, do you have a way to, to, to do this? Um, once in a while, we're able to put people together and, and kind of make suggestions. Oftentimes, the faculty find that themselves, um, or they're not maybe as always open because they have their own ideas on how they want to pursue things. So I think I would say we're, careful in making certain suggestions, um, but, but if the opportunity is there, uh, we, we do put them in touch with more of the, the, the venture lab and more of the commercialization kind of assistance, just sort of think, what, how could this technology, what are some possible commercialization paths? Is it to build a module yourself? Is it to plug into a, a process or method that's already out there? So those are the kind of things we can help them with. Once in a while, pieces click together and we can introduce them to another faculty member whose invention we think is complementary, whose technology is. A lot of times they know what, what people on campus do, so to the extent that we feel that it fits and they're open to it, we will go ahead and make that suggestion. Uh, the world revolves around competition, and obviously we're in competition, UCF that is, with, with other universities as well, but, but because of the budget situation perhaps, and, and maybe perhaps because of the technology, do you ever find yourself working with other um, your, your counterpart at perhaps other institutions? Absolutely, we have one uh, joint technology that's looking at potential malaria um, anti-malaria compounds, and it's a joint collaboration with Harbor Branch um, Institute, and that's uh, part of now of uh, Florida Atlantic University. So we work with them, and Burnham uh, at Lake Nona as well is involved. So we have three-way collaboration going. We're just you know, I think when you came up, I was talking to the um, Harbor Branch people, and we're just planning how are we going to do this? How are we going to assess this technology? 
technology? So very much so. We see a lot of collaborative work. We, we love that, uh, very open to it. We have also collaborative work with uh, Moffitt, uh, from, um, which is, we used to be the part of USF, center, yeah. yeah, the Cancer Center. So um, it, we're very, very open to that, very happy to work with them, easy going, find very um, good working relationships and how to move forward. Uh, keep everybody in the loop and we we definitely as, as these collaborations go forward what I'd like to find out from the investigators is who do they see taking the lead because um, I really need to know that in how I approach the the, the collaborative relationship um, so they have certainly they have the they have their ideas on how the co collaboration works technically and scientifically what I'd like to know is are where's the future intellectual property going to come from is it our person who's taking the lead then I try to position myself in these discussions with other other universities that we really would like to take the lead. We feel that th this is where this uh, technology is going to go and we're well suited to pursue it further. Oftentimes there's no friction or people are happy to let somebody else take the lead because technology transfer offices are uh, very busy, understaffed usually, and so if somebody comes forward and says we'd love to take a lead on this joint invention, like sure, keep us in the loop, let us know, let's talk. They want to be they want to be part of the process. So they, it's not, they don't want to sort of say send me a copy of the patent application when it's done. They want to know, they want to be a part of as it's written and, and the strategy behind it, um, but they're very open to having anybody take the lead who is in a reasonable position to do it and, and you know, can, can really guide it forward, move it forward. I would think that lead, though, would be critical from, from a payback, if you will. In other words, if, if something comes out to be very successful, those in the lead are the ones who are going to perhaps benefit the most. Sure, and we definitely talk about arrangements of sharing royalties, and that's all part of it. And we usually, um, once we get a little bit further along, once we know it's going to be a patent application, we'll start working on an interinstitutional agreement, which could be two parties or three parties if it's a three-way collaboration. Get everybody in the loop and talk about how we're going to divide this. So there'll be, and basically that agreement will set out who is going to be taking the lead in patent prosecution and marketing, and then how the profits are, are going to be divided. And usually it's a very reasonable arrangement where we'll first, of any profits that are coming and we'll take and, and pay back the cost that, that we've put into it for the patent expenses and then things get divided equally. It just depends on maybe on the number of inventors from each institution. It could be divided by just if we have the greater number, we get a greater percentage. Um, we'll also maybe anticipate how much future intellectual property will be created and if we have that, then maybe we'll have a stronger piece. Um, so there's all these variations on how this, this can come together, but uh, it it's usually works out really well. We haven't had problems where we just kind of hit a dead end and can't move forward. Well, I wish I brought one, but, but the, the paperwork for, for a patent application is, I mean, we kill a lot of trees doing this. I mean, it's just We huge. do, yeah, and we try to kind of stay in the electronic, uh, our database, like in our database, we're trying to keep electronic copies so we don't print out so many, but once in a while, you gotta see the thing. Yeah, they're they're very huge. I mean, it could be hundreds, uh, hun over 100 pages, 160 pages, uh, especially when you start to do foreign applications, you know, just kind of, get uh, built up and the patent offices they they know and they're not so happy about the big bad applications and they try to kind of divide them out they say well that there's two you have multiple inventions here we want you to refile them as two separate ones so you kind of get that they um, assess extra fees for if you have your claims are over a certain number they start to charge you almost like a la carte you know so if you have this many uh, claims you're trying to put in well it's gonna cost you more so uh, but but yeah it, sometimes it's, it's unavoidable if there's just if it's broad kind of core technology that has a lot of use, it's going to be a big patent application, and the patent office will come back saying, "Yeah, you got to split it out." Like, okay, we'll you know split it up. You have to work with the patent office, but uh, definitely a lot of work goes into putting a patent application together. You know, I've been speaking in terms of, of you know our environment at UCF and in the immediate area, pretty much. But when you get into research, I mean, it is a worldwide phenomenon. I mean, it's something that whatever is done here, maybe somebody else is working on it in another continent, uh, and and. I guess you have to look at that that big picture as well when you start getting into the, the whole process of okay who's doing what and, and how can we either work with them or, or in some instances compete with them. Right, absolutely. When, when we get a, a new invention we look to see what has been done in the past, who's our close competitor, who's working on this, are they a competitor, are they a collaborator, could we maybe co-market this, could we talk to them and see if this fits in with their intellectual property package that, that it could go together as a, as a bundle. Uh, we would definitely look at the context, like who else is out there. Um, and, and we look at what we call prior art to see what else has been done 
in this area and how is that going to affect our ability to get the bigger piece of intellectual property. And, and we really think if it's going to be very narrow, we talk to the investigator, we say, well, we're not sure it's really going to have value in commercializing it because there's so much, the intellectual property landscape is so crowded, we're not going to be able to carve out a reasonable piece. That doesn't happen very often, but once in a while we, we get into a situation like that and we have to assess, do we really want to protect it? Is it something that's going to be commercially viable or do we just let it kind of be published and become part of the, the, the public domain? If you had one wish at this stage, um, what do you think it would be in terms of uh, trying to enhance uh, the technology transfer operation at, at UCF? I would love to have more money coming in, maybe state funding coming in for technology transfer, for the offices to use for our processes, for advertising, commercializing, to hire students to help us do technology summaries. As, as I was saying, most offices find themselves, I was just talking to everybody here, and they share the same views that we're, um, understaffed. There's just so much technology going out there. Very hard to be able to assess it, just what we were saying, too, to look at prior art, to look how it fits in, to look at the commercialization potential um, and, and rank it and, and, move, and, and get it protected because you have to really work closely with the scientists, with the attorneys to, to develop it. We're saying kind of think about proactively where it's headed and how big of a piece we can get and that takes a lot of time and effort. And so we don't end up having the time to, um, to, to, to advertise it properly and and, and that's where I think we, we've really struggled. I'd love to have more money to be able to hire students to summarize the technologies. What I've been able to do in life sciences, we have our life sciences um, website up. It lists all of our available technologies, fully searchable HTML um, version of it, as well as PDF. Barb Abney has been absolutely um, very, very helpful in, in getting that um, set up and going and so but it's been a struggle and it took a long time I've been in the office for nearly two years and we're just unveiling the website would have loved to have some funding coming in especially from the state just for tech transfer office where we can get more staff get more students involved um, and really what we would love to do is have like a little fund where we can give um, money to the scientists to take to take the technologies to the next step maybe they need a piece of equipment so we call it kind of a slush fund or you know just so that maybe 10,000 per investigator or so to just give them what they need to get the technology to the next level which will make it so much more commercializable. A little incentive tech if you will. A little yeah. incentive, <laughs> is, if whatever, you know, it, it could be maybe putting them, uh, doing a collaboration with a clinician where they can get human samples in, um, where they, they need to be able to fund it, they might need a coordinator for the clinical trial or something. So some money to get them to that next level, we can get more data. We were saying maybe animal studies, animal studies are expensive. They love to give them some money to do additional work to get us to, to enrich our portfolio, to take it further, to give us more data in support of our technology so that it'll be more um, commercializable. Well, as the old saying goes, you got to spend money to make money, right? That's right. Yeah, I've been saying that in the office a lot. <laughs> Svetlana, thank you so much for coming by and joining yeah. us today. And we'll hear much more about technology transfer in future editions of Zenith. Right now, let's take a little break for our Research Minute. The high-level data that's always been shared by law enforcement is only about 3% of what the police really need to share electronically, and that's what Finder's done. It's really automated our business process. So something that used to take two or three days to get accomplished by an investigator is now done in a matter of 15 seconds. The consortium of law enforcement agencies that came up with the concept of this data sharing technology came to the University of Central Florida and we used their development staff here through the College of Engineering. And that is what res actually began the cost benefit. We use graduate students. Um, we are not a vendor, therefore we don't have a profit margin to uh, pass on to the agencies. We're public safety. And that partnership between law enforcement and the university is how we first developed the software. And our time has once again slipped away. But check back here often for new episodes of Zenith. You can find us on Bright House Digital Channel 1, as well as On Demand Channel 300. Plus, we live almost forever on the web at www.ucf.tv. The goal of research is to better understand the world around us. Our goal is to be a window to that world. I'm Ed Hyland. Thanks for joining us on Zenith.